Jesus has a way of teaching us things that are the opposite of what everyone else is doing or even what we want to do. And so as we look in the this series on the attitudes and we get our attitude adjustment, today we're talking about grief. And Jesus encourages us to grieve. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It was Ken Doka who coined the phrase disenfranchised grief. Grief that people experience when they incur a loss that is not or cannot be openly acknowledged, socially sanctioned, or publicly mourned. So what happens is we have things in our life that we're sad about, that we have losses, but we can't grieve those things because it's not acceptable by society or by our own expectations to grieve those things. So here we are living in a world today, and I, I argue that one of the things America needs to do right now in the Western world, all the world, is to grieve. We've lost a lot in the last few years, but I think a lot of it has become disenfranchised because it's because everybody's going through so much, we somehow think that what we've gone through isn't significant enough to grieve or to experience sadness about. And I think that creates a perpetual state of sadness. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 13, laughter can conceal a heavy heart, but when the laughter ends, the grief remains. So I believe that Jesus is teaching us an attitude of grieving, of mourning, because it's the only way to let the bad stuff go. And that's what's important about grief. Grief helps us let go of the difficult things. Just because everyone is struggling doesn't mean you aren't struggling. And just because everyone's going through things doesn't mean the things that you're going through are less significant. So Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. So today, there are some things that we need to mourn. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. We should first, we should grieve our sins. I know that's unpopular. I know the idea that we might have sins is unpopular. But the truth is, is that every human being has rebelled against God. We were born into the worst and deepest grief that could possibly be known. We are a mankind without a God because of Adam's choices in the garden that we inherited. So every one of us is born into this world as in a state of rebellion and without a father, as an orphan, so to speak, and we don't know how to get back. That's something definitely worth grieving. Also, not only have we rebelled against God and do we have sin, but also we have harmed others. Because of our wounded nature, wounded, hurt people hurt people, and that's us. We, have, we, we like to consider ourselves the good guys, the kind ones, but we know what we're really like. We know what we're like on our worst days. And we need to ask ourselves, what would the world be like if everyone else was like me? I'm thinking I wouldn't want to live here. So we've not only rebelled against God, we have harmed other people. People usually that we care the most about. We hurt them all the time. And we are not good people. Everyone likes to argue, well, you know, people are basically good. If you give them enough money and satisfy enough of their needs, they'll do the right thing. Well, that's not true. Because we're in rebellion against God, because we've hurt people and we've never resolved that pain, because there are things wrong within us that we just can't fix. And the beginning of the fix is grief, is learning to mourn those things, learning to grieve the things that are wrong in us, within us, deeply within us. So we should grieve our sins. We should grieve our rebellion against God. We should also grieve for our world. The Bible says, we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Our world's broken. Stuff's going on that should not be going on if it was truly filled with good people. Most of us like to think that if we were God, we'd make sure that no one suffered and we'd make sure all the bad things stopped. But all that would make you as a tyrant because the only way that could happen is if you took away people's free will and you stopped letting them be free and do the things they wanted to do. I think we'd make terrible gods. I think God is an amazing God. But there are things in our world that shouldn't be here. Sickness, chronic illness, terminal illness, slavery, oppressing, oppression, forcing other people's will upon others, and just the condemnation of the innocent while the guilty tend to go free. This place is broken and it's corrupt. Evil people have so much power. They take away good things in the name of science that were efficient and cheap to replace them with expensive, less efficient things. It happens all the time. The world's broken. It's corrupt. Not only that, it's condemned already. 
Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but God rem- but remains under God's angry judgment. No one is waiting for God to drop the gavel. The gavel has been dropped. The sentence of death has been pronounced. And, and we aren't waiting for some courtroom appearance. We are condemned already. And we should grieve that. When are we going to grieve that? When are we going to stop and realize the difficulty of our situation, of the world in which we live, how difficult and bad things are? When are we going to be sad about that rather than just ignore that and carry on with our lives? Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. There's something very different about the world you live in and the world that you're going to as a child of God. And we need to love God and grieve the loss, the corruption, the brokenness of this world. And I I conclude that. I want to conclude with, yes, we should grieve. Jesus taught us to grieve. Grieve our own sinfulness and rebellion. Grieve the world in which we live But we need to learn to do this because we trust Jesus. Anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. This is what Jesus said about people who ignored his way. And this is where we're at right now. Do you choose your way or Jesus' way? Because Jesus' way is usually the dead opposite of my way. A lot of people accuse Jesus of being a revolutionary, and he was, but not for the reasons they think. They think he was a revolutionary because of him uh, cleansing the temple. And they imagine him some political revolutionary standing for their political viewpoints, but that's not who Jesus is. He did cleanse the temple, but he did not cleanse the Roman praetorium. He did not deal with Pilate's house, and they were the evil, corrupt power in charge. He dealt with God's people. He dealt with worship. He made a path for people to get to God. Why? Because he represented a new kingdom. Was Jesus political? Yes. He is overthrowing all of the kingdoms of earth with a new kingdom that is one of love and of power and of a sound mind and of gentleness and kindness and all of these things. Jesus is also revolutionary because he has the nerve to tell you what to do, to tell you and me that the way we want to do things naturally is wrong and that the right way is to love our enemies, is to forgive people, is to step out in faith and trust God, is to give, is to grieve, as we've talked about today. So will you choose Jesus' way? Will you commit to Jesus' path for your life, even though it may seem impossible, even though, especially when, it doesn't make sense. And in light of today, are you willing to be sad, to be free? What if some sadness is just a pathway, a valley between your darkness today and your freedom tomorrow? So I encourage you, I encourage myself, let us reach up and listen to Jesus. Let's follow his word. Let's fill our lives with his attitudes. And the one we're talking about today is to grieve, to let go of the things that are harming us and the world in which we live.